Um, and so if you have your Bibles, meet me in the book of John, beginning at the 12th chapter. When you get there, say something. If you're not there yet, say, hold up. Wait a minute. John, the 12th chapter, beginning at the first verse. <clears throat> when you get there, say something. Something. And it reads, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, my kind of gal. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. It was intended that she saved this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. I want to continue in the series, The Judas Factor, The Hidden Power of Betrayal. Uh, look at your neighbor and tell them, even if it's by faith, it was good for me that I was betrayed. Tell them that. Tell them. <laughs> Sit down. Now, I know that was a difficult statement to make for you by faith because nobody likes to experience betrayal disloyalty or denial in any human relationship. Without question, every hardship, every difficulty, every bit of disappointment you've had in human relationship, I believe was necessary to make you who you are today. As we seek to become like Jesus, the ultimate goal of God, and I know we, we recite this scripture, but we don't complete it. He says, all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. But he continues, he says, for those he foreknew, he Predestined. I love how those two things come together, foreknowledge and predestination. Foreknowledge has to do with his knowledge of you before you were. Predestination has to do with where he called you to go before you were. You can't separate these two realities because when you bring them together, you'll find that God looked at where he called you to go, what he designed you to do, and as he was fashioning you, considered who you needed to be to successfully navigate where he called you to be. Foreknowledge has to do with who he designed you to be before you were. Predestination has to do with what he assigned you to do and where he designed you to go before you were. He brings both of those things together to ensure that your path is sure. Then he goes on to say, those he foreknown, he predestined for what? To become conformed into the image of his son, to look like Jesus. But if we're to look like Jesus, we have to take the full scope of Jesus's ministry. And we can't cherry pick those things that we like, those attributes that are necessary for us to get to where we want to go, those attributes that are comfortable. But no, we have to observe the full scope and spectrum of Jesus's ministry, both the depth and the breadth of Jesus's ministry. And one of the things that makes me uncomfortable as I'm trying to be more like Christ is how Christ could live for three and a half years. Now, understand it's to fulfill prophecy, but there are always multi layers to divine revelation. It is never simply to produce or to fulfill prophecy, but it must serve a divine purpose and be a part of God's 
divine will, even if it is fulfilling prophecy. So it's never just to fulfill prophecy, but it is to both fulfill prophecy and also reveal a dimension of God we may not have known. So if I'm going to be like Jesus, one of the things I'm wrestling with as I look at the life of Jesus, as I do a character study of Jesus, is how could Jesus have with him for three and a half years someone who he dined with, someone who rolled with the rest of the disciples who was a traitor? And the question is, is there value in having a traitor at the table? What can be learned? What can be gleaned? What could be observed? We talked about this the week before last. We actually started with a roomy poem that was entitled Guest House. And I shared with you, we've been taught in Christian church in many respects to, to fight to war against or to, with popular preachers today, to escape difficult realities. Uh, but the reality is there are times where we need to welcome or draw close or allow close or proximity the things that are unseating to us because there is value often in the things that disturb us or the things that unseat us. So we, we practice welcoming at times those things as opposed to fighting and warring those things or escaping those things because there is a value in sometimes enduring those things. And sometimes they're not things, they're relationships, they're, they're people, they are challenging individuals. As I allow it in, I could observe, I could dissect and ultimately, I can become better. People who cannot deal with challenging circumstances or endure in uh, challenging individuals who are limited to interactions with those who like them or, or they like will always be limited in their impact and influence in the world. Some of you have had a stalemate at your company because, again, your boss realizes that you're competent and creative, but your ability to endure people you don't like or do not like you causes your contribution to be brought into question. Because the moment that there is a rift, the moment that there is an offense, that is your breaking point. And you only are as influential as your breaking point. Jesus allows a Judas at his table. Jesus has a remarkable capacity to not deal with everything immediately. It is, it is the human will that wants relief from everything that is difficult immediately. That's why everybody goes crazy when we, we, we get buzzwords like, God's going to elevate above your haters. Oh! You need to change up your circle. Ah. <laughs> this is the year where I'm cutting people off. Ah. And you know, I always ask the question, if everybody's shouting on that part, who is the hater? Yeah. Another, another time, for another time. Because we want immediate relief from difficult circumstance. But Jesus was able to deal with the discomfort of a Judas in his midst because he did not need immediate relief. But he had the capacity to allow him to come near without severing or isolating. Why? Because he had something that all of us need to cultivate. He had security and confidence in two things. Number one, in the protection of God and the incorruptibility of the purpose of God. It takes confidence in God and clear understanding of the incorruptibility of the person or the purpose of God in your life, even if there is a Judas. You cannot sit next to difficult people 
if you think that their presence will detour your purpose. We, if we're inti more intimidated and we fear our enemies more than we do our God, we can never allow them to sit in proximity, even if it's for a temporary period. But what allowed Jesus to have a Judas at the table is he understood ultimately there's nothing Judas can do to detour the will of God for my life. In fact, if he does what he does the right way, is uncomfortable and as dishonoring as it is, it will accelerate the purposes of God in my life. Y'all read about Joseph, right? Thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, went to prison before he ever got to the palace. But by the time it was all over, he said, that was my past. And let me tell you what happened in my past. All of the hell I went through, all of the hate I went through was divinely designed for my elevation and for the glory of God. He came to a place in maturity when he, when he said, what you meant for evil, God turned it around for my good. If he could have said it another way, he could have said that when God gave me the dream before the fulfillment of the dream, he gave me the promise, but did not give me the process, but he had in mind the necessary process to bring me into the prominence of my promise. Are you still here with me? God knew what he would have to go through before he ever went through it, and he established his comeback before he was ever betrayed. When you know that God is orchestrating things for your benefit, you can sit a little longer in the discomfort of having disloyalty at the table. Not only did he do this for Jude, I mean, uh, for, for, for Joseph, but Jesus says the moment that Judas received the bread, ate the bread, and Satan entered into him, he looked and said, go do what you need to do quickly. When Judas got up at the height of his betrayal, at that time, Jesus said, now, now what? Now the Son of God is glorified. How could he say that I'm glorified at the height of betrayal? It's because he understood that what he meant to destroy me is actually being orchestrated by God to accelerate the purposes of God and to bring about ultimately my elevation. I may be set back for a moment, but God is only setting me back for the comeback that's getting ready to take place. When you understand that there's nothing your Judas can do to take, he may detour you, but ultimately cannot deter the purposes of God. Jesus was able to sit for a while with the Judas because he knew that he could not corrupt God's purpose in his life. So he let him be comfortable for a while. He let him eat meals to break bread with him. We're going to get to this in a minute. Y'all, he let him hold the money. And nestled in this passage of Scripture and nestled in this, this observation of Jesus' life is a lesson for us all about the necessity of hardship, not only in circumstance, but the necessity of hardship in human relationship. That whenever, the Thomas Merton quote is, whenever you try to avoid suffering, you almost always end up suffering more because you atrophy your ability to endure hardship. Are you still here with me? The only way that you get thick skin is by rubbing up against callous circumstance. You admire people who can stand in boldness when the entire city is talking about them or when they are criticized. You admire people that are able with thick skin to move into the purpose of God against opposition, but they didn't get there from birth. They got there through harsh and adverse circumstance. You don't build up thick skin from everybody being nice to you and praiseworthy. You build up thick skin 
with people that have proximity to you that have hurt you at some point in time. But when the healing comes, while God should keep you tender, you listen, you heal stronger than you were when there was offense. And the only way you do that is by facing adverse circumstance and brushing up against what is uncomfortable. I know you want to follow Jesus and become more like Jesus, conformed to the image of Jesus, but please understand, you, you have to observe the full scope. Jesus allowed a Judas at his table. He welcomed it. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. So he welcomed the presence of what was uncomfortable because there was still a redemptive purpose in it. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but there is a redemptive purpose. I know you don't feel it right now, but there is a redemptive purpose in every hater. There is a redemptive purpose in every challenge. Not that that was their intention, but it's God's design to take all of it, the good, the bad, and the ugly to conform you into the image of Christ. And as your Judas is sitting at the table, you're becoming conformed into the image of Christ. Notice this. Notice this. So you got to learn to get a little more comfortable. Don't be, un, don't be unmoved. You're changing plans for stuff you wanted to go to because you found out they're going to be there. <laughs> now, you're not at your friend's party. And you got them frustrated, and it has nothing to do with them because you heard <laughs> she's going to be there. He's going to be there. <laughs> and if, if you're fairly righteous, you pretend like you're sick. <laughs> if you want to let it be known, you drop hints. It can't both of us be in the same place <laughs> at the same time. But here, the master of all has another dinner. And I told you that dinners and meals represent intimate proximity. Meal, biblically, was more than just a meal. It was intimate proximity. As they walked with Jesus on the road after his, his resurrection, he taught them and he, they, they were intrigued with him. But it wasn't until they sat down at the table and broke bread that their eyes were open and they saw who he really was because there's an intimacy in the meal. This doesn't speak of just a general hater. This, this is someone in your intimate circle, but if you judge your Judas too quickly, you will pull up the wheat with the tear because it is difficult, as I said the first week, to determine up front who is Peter and who is Judas, who is a denier versus who is a betrayer. While Jesus knew all that because he knew all things, sometimes it's difficult for us to discern who is a denier and who is a betrayer. If it is a denier who God's going to do something with, ultimately, you got to learn to sit in that and love them through those challenges to get to the redemptive part of that side of that relationship. But if it is a Judas, you don't know. Sometimes you have to sit through that too to figure out who is the wheat and who is the tear? Who needs to be preserved and who needs to be cast out? When it's too early, you cannot tell who is who. So you have to let them grow up together, not judge it too quickly so that you'll be able at the appointed and proper time to separate, to redeem the Peter while discarding the Judas. So by welcoming Judas to the table, here are a couple things that happen real quick. I uh, don't have time to go to a full exhaustive review, but here we go. When we can welcome presence, number one, there is a mirroring refinement. Go back and read uh, or study that uh, from a couple weeks ago. There is a mirroring refinement. Nothing exposes our inner Judas capacity like a Judas. By the way, oh, you didn't know, we all have a Judas capacity. As I told you, as we're talking about haters and everybody goes crazy, both you and your hater are shouting. 
And the reality is, both of y'all, you're not Jesus, baby. Isn't it funny how we always make ourselves Jesus in the narrative? fascinating book you need to go read. You need to go read on your own time, A Tale of Three Kings, where it talks about the struggle between uh, Absalom, David, and Saul. Because we always make ourselves the hero of the narrative. I'm David. <laughs> I was hated on by Saul. And my son tried to take me out. Both the older generation and the younger generation are trying to take me out, but God will hold me up. What he argues is there's a little David in you, but there's a little Saul. And there is an Absalom proclivity in us all. And I know you don't like this because you made yourself the Jesus of your story. But let me help you. We all got a little bit of Judas. <laughs> That's what the psalm tells us, or the proverb tells us, whenever you hear someone over, you overhear someone talking or saying something about you, before you jump at them, consider how many times you yourself have also talked about someone. And if your line was tapped and your room was bugged, and your DMs were disclosed. You have all, we have all violated in the same way we criticize others for violating. Are you still here with me? It is always, I don't know why she back up in here. Listen, she, after all that she did coming to church, praise the Lord, how are you? And if you hear someone did not like your shoes, Judas. <laughs> Having a Judas near reveals the marrying effect, the marrying refinement, because you don't get the, we don't generally get the lesson about how not to violate or see how we violate until we are violated in the same way. You, 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 you yell at people and everybody has to understand that, that when you don't eat and get hungry, you're cranky but you got a good heart. <laughs> so often what God will do to, because the heart will deceive you into believing that anything you give in this world is justified while when observing it in others, it is intentional, it is rebellion in them, but it's frailty in you. Yours was with a good heart, but with a misunderstanding. But theirs was with malice because their heart is wrong. But when there's a marrying effect, the benefit of having a Judas and being violated is that you're able to see how not to violate. And sometimes you're it is revealed how you have been violating others without even knowing it. So often when God wants to keep you from yelling at people, he will give you a mirror. Not in Jesus' case, but for us, the mere mortals, there is a benefit to being violated in that way. So when God tries to keep us from going off on others, he'll let somebody go off on us and see how bad that feels so that it calibrates us as we move forward. We become more like Christ often, not through people that praise us, but through people who mirror the possibilities in us. It's cool what you're wondering I, when somebody walks in, what, I'm not flirtatious, girl. But God will allow you sometimes to be in a situation where they wonder and they may look like you looked and you feel how that feels. What you looking at? <laughs> what? I'm not doing anything. We learn how not to violate often from being violated. 
I'm not suggesting that we want this or that it's right. I'm simply saying that there is a lesson in every Judas, but, but, but also it, it exposes our Judas capacity. It, it, it gives a greater grace capacity, as I shared before, because we don't know who Jesus is, uh, 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 J- Judas is, and we don't know who Peter is. So we have to give it time to see who's who. But today's lesson is this. Judas is develop help to develop our discernment. There is a dimension of discernment that is a spiritual gift and an impartation of the living God. But there is also a discernment that comes through empirical observation of the world around you and practical wisdom as you see circumstances play out. Sometimes God develops us by revelation, other times God develops us by circumstance. God will never simply develop you all by supernatural download and revelation, nor will God simply develop us all through circumstance. But God has in tandem both circumstance and divine revelation that shape us in who he's called us to be. So sometimes God will give us the download, watch out for them. Other times, God will give us lessons in life to allow us to see the kind of patterns of people we need to watch out for. Are you still here with me? And when we need to see actual patterns, God will not just give us divine revelation, but he'll put us in proximity to someone that will teach us lessons for where we're ultimately going. Look at your neighbor, tell him, you need your Judas more than you realize. So we have Jesus here at this table, another table, and Judas is there. He doesn't scowl. It doesn't mess up his flow. You have to learn how to focus on the purpose of God and give yourself to the purpose of God. Because the more time you spend on your Judas, there is time taken away from your divine purpose. You cannot engage your divine purpose and engage your Judas at the same time. You've got to learn to push Even if there is physical proximity, you've got to learn to partition in your spirit your Judas from your purpose. Because if the devil, listen, if if your Judas gets under your skin, the devil will always make sure there's a Judas in your life. Every time you get ready to upgrade, every time you get ready to walk through a new door, every time God gets ready to bless you, every time there's a new assignment, the enemy will ensure that a Judas emerges because you're good in until there's someone who does not like you who comes along. You're good until a word of criticism comes along. You're good until someone betrays you. And the moment they betray you, you shift from the purpose of God to nursing your wounds by trying to address or eliminate the Judas in your life. You ever seen boxers where they watch the video and tell you when he fakes left, you hit him with a cross? They know his routine so well that when they see the vulnerability, they capitalize. Can I tell you that the enemy studies you so well? Every time you're on the verge of doing something significant from God, he hits you with the okie doke and you've fallen for it time after time after time. But God ordered your behind in here today to usher you to your next place, to usher you to your next level. And you're not going to get to your next level when the enemy sends a distraction every time you're on the verge of a new place. You've got to learn how to resist the enemy and stay fixed on your purpose. 
before Jesus ever did a miracle, before he enters into his public ministry, what happens? Satan comes and tries to hit him with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he said, I ain't studying you today, devil, because on the other side of this, I know God has something. And I've been around long enough to know when I'm on the verge of something great, you always try to send the distraction to have me fix and focus on what I need to get beyond. I ain't blogging about you. I ain't going to be on social media. I'm not going to spend any time talking about it's time to elevate above my haters. I don't have time to even type that. Why? Because I'm fixed and focused on the will of God. And I know that I'm coming out of this season better than I went into this season. I'm in the Word, y'all. The Bible said he went into the wilderness led by the Spirit, but he came out of the wilderness in the power. God, I feel it. Grab somebody by the hand. Tell them I'm coming out better than I went in. I went into the wilderness led, but I'm coming out in a new power. And the only way I'm coming out in new power is if I resist the enemy. If I don't focus on him, he'll flee from me because he knows that trick ain't gonna work no more. Touch five people, tell them, get free, get free, get free, get free. You're going to have to upgrade your challenge. You're not going to distract me on the verge of a new level. I got things to do. I got places to go. There are people waiting on me to walk in my purpose. Rabbi Shekhar, I don't say there are people waiting on me to walk in my purpose. I'm not going to cry another tear about this one. I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus and see the salvation. Salvation. Salvation of the Lord. It is. It's your Judas that helps you, oh my God, develop discernment. Oh, we got to go, but listen. It, it develops your discernment to have folks with all the right words, but all the wrong motives around you. Because you learn, not just through revelation, but you learn through experience. You are cultivated when you have people with all the right words, but all the wrong motivation. Here Jesus was at the table, and they were there to honor him because he just raised Lazarus from the dead. And she comes, Mary, and takes a year's salary worth of perfume and pour. That must have been some good stuff. I wonder what that smelled like. Uh, 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 and a, a whole year's salary? A, a perfume? Man, I thought I had some good ones. But Mary brought out the good stuff. You know, it's one of those where you go in the back room. There's nothing here in retail. They're coming back here to this room. A year's salary worth of perfume. Because when God has blessed you abundantly, I don't have time to do this, if, but like I want to, I can't do it justice. But when God has blessed you abundantly, you lavish your love. There is no expense spared when God has blessed you abundantly. When God, abundant God blesses you, there is abundant praise. If you really honor God for what God has done, you, you, you try to the best of your ability, even with your limited capacity and resource, to pay back, to give to God the honor that God deserves. She said, she, this man brought my brother back from the dead. I'm not going to spare, spare expense, but I'm going to pour everything I have on his feet. And I don't have time to grab a towel. I'm going to dry his feet with my hair. People around say, that's beautiful. Based on what Jesus has just done for her, Jesus sits there, doesn't stop her at all, but allows her to continue to lavish this on him. And nobody has a problem. <laughs> but Judas. We got to go, but notice this. He says, um, wait a minute. This beautiful act. The aroma's filling the house. Judas says, well, wait a minute. Um, hey. Notice this, watch the righteous statement 
covering the wicked motive. Because when you move into higher circles, whether it's the upper echelon of ministry or whether it is in society, the hate is different. They don't just let it all hang out and say what they're really thinking. But they use fine-sounding arguments to sabotage good work under the guise of morality. Churches have been torn apart not from people standing up who had Absalom spirits saying, get out of here, I'm a hater and can't stand to be in this place. It, it comes through a leader preaching and they're preaching using the same Bible undermining what they just taught. It comes very, very, very subtly in, in the workplace. It comes very, very subtly. It's after the vision meeting. You second in command when you get to the break room after the vision meeting. Well, I, I don't, here's what I don't agree with. You don't say it just like that, but you'll say, hey, I have a question, and, and you, you throw questions, not, not necessarily because you have questions, but throw questions to, to, to thwart the progress of the organization, not because you really care about the organization, but because there is something that is unclean and impure on the, impure on the inside of you. Jesus wanted his disciples savvy, so to teach them how this works, he brings a Judas to the table so that they can observe it for where they're ultimately going. Everybody says he's worthy of this honor, but notice Judas can't sit with that. Can I tell you how true haters are revealed? They're revealed often when you fall or in a deficit position and you don't have strength, or they are revealed when you're elevated and honored. Always watch how people respond to your elevation and honor, because the way people respond to your elevation and honor will help you determine what's really on the inside of their heart. Are you still here with me? I'm glad you can rock with me when we're on the same level, but question is, can you show up in the same way when God temporarily or even permanently elevates me beyond where you're capable of going. That's how you know who your ride or dies are. Not just when we're all on the same level. Can you show up and laugh in my mansion the same way you did when we were sharing a studio apartment? Can you show up and, and, and celebrate when I pull up in my Rolls Royce in the same way we did when we were sitting on the bus stop with, a, with two transfers in our hand? Is there anybody here that knows a person's motives are revealed when you're at your lowest and when you begin to elevate beyond where they are. They're all honoring Jesus and Judas, his inner hater, comes out, wait, wait. We shouldn't be using the money like that. That could have given a year's, a year's worth of wages. There are poor people out here struggling. And you're going to put that on Jesus' feet? Wait. Sounds noble. It sounds real pure. He says, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. The Bible said, all right, let me cut to the chase. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor. He said this because he was stealing the money. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself, the Bible says, to what was in there. He spoke about care for the poor, but stole the money as the treasure. If I had not had, listen to me, Jesus brings him near so that everyone could observe, and there's a benefit to this, if anybody's like me, you know that if you had not had some Judases in your life, up close and personal, you wouldn't know how to spot them a mile away. Yeah. Jesus knew, but it was a lesson for disciples who would take up the leadership when he was gone. He let Judas at the table so they could learn to spot this when they saw it. He let Judas at the table so that they could see the full breadth 
and spectrum of the human condition as we're wrestling to meet God's standard coming from the frailty of our own humanity. He showed them the full spectrum. And for every Peter that was noble, there's always a Judas at the table. Listen, just so you can prepare yourself, God will never have long term you sit at a table without there being a Judas. And if you are at a table where there are no Judases, you're not growing or going to the next level. There will always be a rub. Get used to it. Get prepared for it. When you know the forecast, you can handle it better. If I knew it's going to be 50 degrees out here and I put the proper attire on, I can laugh and joke. I don't like the cold, but I can weather the cold when I know the forecast. Now, if I don't know the forecast is 50 degrees outside and I put on a tank top and some sunglasses, that entire experience is going to be hell. Why am I telling you that God will always have some Judases at the table so that you will not fall apart once you recognize that they're there. You need to get to a point where you're able to peep it, you're able to see it, but while you see it, you don't give it all of the energy, all of the time. Some of y'all have missed your purpose trying to get to a new table because a Judas is at this one. Well, question, do you see the other 11 people that are rocking with you, that are for you, that are with you? The enemy will always elevate the one problem person over the 11 that are still there with you. I refuse to leave my table because there is one Judas I do not like. I'm going to stay here and do God's will because I understand ultimately I'm not going anywhere. God's established me. He's going to have to go somewhere eventually. I'm not going to let the devil in him be greater than the Jesus in me. No, I'm going to stand on Christ, the firm foundation, the rock on which I stand with everything around me shaking. I've never been more glad I have my faith in Jesus. Let me connect it to the message. As I'm anchored, what is around me has to adjust. But God brings them near because he does not always give everything through revelation, but he gives some things through experience. And you will not have discernment if you had not had some Judases in your life. If you were honest, real honest, what gave you wisdom weren't people that you liked, but what gave you wisdom are people that thought you thought were rocking with you that did you wrong. What gave you wisdom and the ability to handle criticism for where you're going because you're not gonna do anything significant for God without criticism. Jesus was anchored. He understood that there are people that were praising him, but the same people that praised him when he came to town, some of them call for his crucifixion not long after. You understand your purpose and you're anchored in your assignment when you know that God will bring Judas's near to give you greater discernment. Now notice this. I said he brought Judas near, brought him to the table, and later when the apostles were in, as you can count in the book of Acts after Jesus ascended to heaven. And it's funny how we use this for all sorts of things. And some have used this for offerings and all sorts of things. The hundredfold blessing, the hundredfold blessing. God's going to give you a hundredfold if you leave your mother, your father, your family, and give up houses for my sake. I will give you a hundredfold in this lifetime. And many have realized, some commentators have even said there's never been a hundredfold blessing. It, like Jesus was lying. But no, it wasn't the way it was expected. They didn't walk away from a fishing business and get ten more fishing business so that they're balling. But the fulfillment of this prophecy is in the book of Acts. The Bible says that, that when they heard this message of the kingdom and they realized that their inheritance is not in their property anymore, but their inheritance is in the kingdom of God. And to a Jewish mind, that is very profound because to them, their land and their possession, their land is their inheritance, is what they receive from their fathers and mothers and what they're going to pass on to their sons and daughters. When they took of their possessions, sold their possessions, and laid it at the apostles' feet, what they were saying is our inheritance is no longer in this land, but our inheritance is in the kingdom of God. So we're going to take all this, sell it, we're going to lay it at the apostles' feet, and it's going to be distributed so that nobody suffers lack. Achim. Achim. It is here that the fulfillment of the hundredfold mothers fathers, sisters, and brothers. They walked away from their family, but received an entire family of kingdom, brothers, sisters, mothers, and daughters. 
They, they gave up their houses, but received the proceeds of hundreds of people who brought the proceeds of their houses and laid them at their feet. Here's how you know you're mature. When you take the resource and don't use the resource that people entrust and lay at your feet just to benefit yourself, but you know you're mature, when you can take that and say there's a kingdom mandate for the resources that have been laid at my feet, I'm going to distribute those now. That's the true honor, not that I have just a bigger house or a better car. The true honor is that God would entrust me with that level of kingdom resource because he knows when it comes to me, I'm going to do the right thing with it. Are you still here with me? They distributed it so that no one had lack. That's the hundredfold. Let's close this thing out. But there was one couple, when everybody brought their hundred, brought the blessing, brought the proceeds, laid the disciples' feet, and nice and fire, brought an offering. Now, before y'all criticize them, I suggest that it's probably bigger than any offering any of us have ever given. Because they brought the offering and made a pledge with each other to pretend like this was the full proceeds of the sale of their property. But the Bible said they kept a little bit back for themselves. Listen, y'all, that was still a good offering. If there's anybody who wants to sell their house in California <laughs> and bring the proceeds to Antioch Church, if you hold a little bit back, I ain't tripping. I ain't, I ain't tripping. I ain't tripping. But when they bring this real good offering, the disciples say, wait a minute, how is it? They don't praise them. They don't say, thanks, brother, for advancing the kingdom. They say, how is it that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? Divine revelation. But it was not simply divine revelation. It was empirical observation. Because before they ever get to governing in the kingdom, they first had a Messiah that taught them how to be patient with one another, that taught them what his kingdom meant, but also a Messiah that taught them through bringing a Judas nearby so they knew how not to trust the right words with the wrong motive. Because Judas said, hey, why didn't you do this? We could give this to the poor. But really, internally, he was a thief and wanted to steal. How did they know the moment that they brought this outside of divine revelation? They knew how to immediately deal with this. They didn't give it a long time to fester. They knew that this wasn't a Peter move. It was a Judas move because they understood after being with him three and a half years that the Judas, as they look back in retrospect, was a person that was able to say all the right things while having all the wrong motives. So what they learned in three and a half years, they were able to spot in three and a half seconds Amen. Amen. later in their life. Isn't it interesting that Jesus gives Judas what will accelerate his demise? He gives him opportunity. He gives him money because it reveals and exposes what's really in his heart. Sometimes you have to give people opportunity and see how they deal with it because you establish a pattern. That's why the parable of the talent, it says that he gave them money and went away for a long time. Say long time. In other words, he wasn't checking up on the daily. How's my money going, man? What you doing with the money? How's it going? Because there are times where those that invested to make more may have taken a loss, and you cannot tell if there's profit or loss by checking every single day up on things. But sometimes you have to leave things be for a long time. He went away for a long time so that when he came back, he was able to see who was Judas and who was Peter. He was able to see who made a profit and who did nothing with what he was given. When you go away for a long time, you're able to deal with people on pattern and not just incident. Because when you deal with someone on an incident, they can wiggle out of that incident with excuses. When you deal with someone on an incident, 
You don't give them grace because we all have a bad day or a bad year or a dark place in our life. And if you're judging me on my incident but not on my track record, then you may throw away a Peter who had a bad day but was getting ready to ball out not long after. Are you still here with me? When you deal with someone on an incident as opposed to a pattern, you can't be definitive because even though they did that incident, you're thinking in the back of your mind, is this really who they are or not? But when you allow them to serve withholding the money or you allow them to, listen, go for a period of time and you're able to establish a track record of incidences, right? You're able when you come back to them to be definitive. The man that came back in the parable of the talents was hard and harsh, not because he was a mean person, but because he had enough time to observe who someone really was so that when it was time to deal with them, he came with boldness, with clarity, and precision to deal with it. The reason we don't have precision is because we're trying to weigh an incident and not establish a pattern. Jesus allowed there to be a Judas for a period of time because when there is a pattern, you cannot wiggle out of multiple incidences. You can have excuses for multiple incidences, and I'm strengthened in authority to deal with and cut off what I need to cut off when it's not just an incident, but when it's a pattern. We got to go. For real, for real. I want you to come back next week. But I want you to see this. Jesus doesn't allow Judas to just do whatever he wants to do. As we close, the temptation for many of us in this room, when you hear this, is just to endure more hell from somebody that doesn't mean you any good. And I want you to understand, there comes a time where things do need to be terminated. And sometimes it's not an issue of forgiveness. You can forgive, but while you're forgiving, it does not mean you give people proximity to you. The Bible says that we are to forgive as Christ forgives. How does Christ forgive? Christ's forgiveness is limited, but as it relates, when we sin, there is not on his part, but on our part, there is violation and separation, not in between us and the love of Christ, but when there is sin that gets into the relationship with us and Jesus, us and God, it creates distance, not in love, but it creates distance in intimacy. And so he requires there for intimacy to be restored, there must be action not on his part. He's consistent. There must be action on the inconsistent party's part, and that is repent. And when you repent, the love that's always been there is present, but the intimacy is restored. And so if I love like Christ, I've got to be able to forgive, but my forgiveness does not mean I give unlimited proximity to me. My forgiveness does not mean if you don't learn how to stop beating me up, that I'm going to live in the same household until you change. I may forgive you, but I'm going to forgive you from a couple cities away in a different house. Are you still here with me? I can love like Christ and not continue to put myself in circumstances that harm me. I want you to hear me. You can forgive your Judas, but it does not mean that there are not boundaries with your Judas. And here's what I love, and this is how Christ files it. You don't find him going on social media and trying to out Judas. You don't find him saying, I got to elevate above my haters. You don't find any of those things. He says, focus on the assignment, but while he's focused, he also files. While while he's focused, he also files. While Judas is there, as we close, for real, for real, (laughs) he always has his 12, but then his three. And he is unapologetic about when there's real business going on 
when he's really in a situation where he needs his ride or die, when he's giving intimate or in an intimate or vulnerable moment, he doesn't argue with them, doesn't fight. He said, listen, y'all post up right here. You three, come with me. Because while Judas may be in proximity or in your orbit, it does not mean that a Judas has permission to find their way into your intimate space. Never let a Judas into your place of vulnerability. Never give a Judas the secret matters of your heart because they will use them to exploit you at the most inopportune times. Don't give it more energy than it deserves, but you got to learn how to tell people, y'all post up right here. I'll be back because we're going to do some business that is vulnerable. We're going to do some business that is intimate. I'm going through some things right now, and I need you to see me in my position of strength, not in my position of deficit, because you'll try to capitalize on my deficit. So I've got to slide away from you for a while and find a few people I can really depend on, a few people I can really trust that can see me in all of my vulnerability so that I can get ready to come back and engage everybody else. You can have Judas in your proximity without giving him intimacy. And as I close with the last point, (laughs) you got to learn to keep yourself focused, to give, to give room, to give room for God. Isn't it interesting how we, we say we trust God and God is our source, God is our protection, God is our shield, God is our shepherd. But the moment there is offense, we don't feel justified unless we take everything into our own hands. They need to hear about this. I need to cut I had to cut them off. I had to pay them back. I had to hurt them for what they've done to me. Jesus said, go do what you do. Because as you go do what you do, God is going to do what he do. Look at your neighbor. Tell them, let them go do what they do. Forgive them so that God can do what he do. I don't know who I'm talking to, but you need to, as the book of Romans says, listen to these words. It says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. That's hard, man. Because everything in us feels like we, we're not justified in And when you're wronged and you can't get back, you feel like you're robbed of something. But I found in my life that those are the moments. That's the test when when you see how real God is to you. The moments in my life where I'm tested on how real God is, is not in the worship service surrounded by saints as we're singing worship and my hands are lifted. That, that's not the time where I test to see how real, just how real God is to me. I see how real God is. We use our faith for homes. We use our faith, faith for cars. We use our faith for new jobs. And we use our faith for all kinds of things. But can I tell you what you need to use your faith for from time to time? When you have to sit in what you can't fix. When you're talked about but can't do anything about it. When you're criticized but can't do anything about it. When someone wounds you and, and everything in you wants to go, to go back and wound them in the same way that they wounded you. But, but, but you, you're, you're forced. You're in this, in this tension. You're, there's this, this wrestling. It's, 
is, is my spirit's telling me to wait on the Lord, and my flesh is telling me to, to do to them what they did to me. And I'm in I'm this tension. I'm in this tension, the good that I would do. I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I'm struggling, Lord. I'm trying. I know your, your, your standard. I know your requirement. But, 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 but when you have to wait, you feel robbed. Does anybody know what it is to feel robbed while you had to wait? To feel robbed after you've done wrong? To, to feel robbed after it was your idea, but they took it and made money on it? To feel robbed while they used you? To get where they wanted to be? And when you brought them into the circle, they, they acted like the one that extended the invitation never existed. Does anyone know what it is like Joseph to sit in the prison and to expect the people that you helped to bail out to remember you when they come into a greater place, but they forgot about you and act brand new and left you right there where you are? Does anybody know the tension of, of being wrong? and wanted to take it into your own hands. He said, listen, don't pay evil for evil. He said, here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to be careful. Be careful. His words. He said, be careful. Be, be careful. Be careful. Why does he say be careful? Because whenever there's offense, whenever you've been wronged, everything in you, you don't think rationally. You think emotionally. You don't think logically. You think impetuously. You don't think about your future. You think about what you want right now, how you want to feel right now. That's why he says, wait, 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 wait. He says, be careful. Be careful. Be careful. He says, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. He says, because the enemy's goal is to put a Judas there. Because the goal is to get you aroused and to get you emotional and to get you out of character and to get you out of Christ likeness. He said, but make sure you be careful in the eyes of everyone. Why? Because people's eyes are on you. Why? Because there's a call on your life. People's eyes are on you. Why? Because God's hands on you. People's eyes are on you. Why? Because when they saw the anointing of the living God over your life and when they've seen his hand on you, the anointing draws attention. It draws their eyes and they're looking for a witness. We know what Jesus did, but they're looking for somebody on earth who can do some of what Jesus did here. So they know it's possible to forgive. So they know it's possible to love. So they know it's possible to stay in the spirit and not get in the flesh. He said, be careful. You've come too hard. You've worked too much. You've been faithful for too long to get out of hand and to mess up the assignment, to mess up the blessing that I have ahead of you. Fight with a Judas. Because when you're fighting with a Judas, they can't see who's who. But you got to be careful. Be careful. Be careful to think about your future. Be careful to think about your children. Be careful to think about your ministry. Be careful to think about your witness. Be careful to think about all that God has for you. Be careful to think about the promises of God that are yea and amen, but have not been fulfilled yet. He says, be careful in the way that you move. Be careful because their eyes are on you. And while God knows your heart, people deal with you on your reputation. So if God desires to use you, but you act a fool in the eyes of people, the same people you were called to bless are now side-eyeing you. Don't fall for the tactic of the enemy, but keep your eyes on somebody tell them I had to cry some tears but my eyes are on the Lord I was frustrated but my eyes are on the Lord I almost lost my mind but my eyes are on some days I don't want to look at him but my future says keep your eyes on the Lord 
you come too far to be distracted, King. Keep your eyes. Keep your eyes. Keep your eyes. I gotta go, but tell somebody, tell them I don't know what you're going through, but keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the master. Keep your eyes on the Lord. God will fight your battles. Keep. We got to go. But here's what I love. He doesn't act like this is easy. But he says, if it is possible, as far as as it depends on you. He said, in these moments, you can't make anybody else do something. You have a full-time job with keeping yourself in the spirit, with keeping yourself righteous. You can't make anybody else do anything. He said, as far as it is possible, as it relates or depends on you. He said, live in peace. I can't determine what they will do, but I can control what I'm going to do. He said, live in peace with everyone. Do not take revenge. God, I feel, I don't know whose word that is. But somebody needs to hear that. You came just for that word. The Lord says, do not take revenge. My dear friends, he says, but leave room. Leave room for the Lord's wrath. For it is written that he is real and don't play about his children. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. But as for you, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heat burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. If there's anybody who says, I don't care what happens, I'm going to stay in the spirit. I'm going to stay anchored. I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. I need you to lift up or I ain't going nowhere. Praise. I need you to lift up or God will repay you. Praise. I need you to be like the Savior who says, forgive them for they know not what they do. I want you to be like Joseph because ultimately you'll be able to say, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for my good, for the saving of many lives. Tell somebody, tell me it was good for me that I was afflicted. It was good for me that I had a Judas because it did nothing but conform me into the image of Jesus. Now I look like Jesus. I walk like Jesus. I talk like Jesus. I love like Jesus. Is there anybody who wants to be like Jesus?